All right. <laughs> well, thank you for those who could make it. Um, obviously, we were trying to have it in person, but the weather was not in our favor today. Um, but we are excited to be able to still have it online here tonight and uh, just have the resource. Uh, we'll have it recorded, just have the resource for everybody who did want to tune in. So we're very lucky to have Courtney first with here uh, with us here tonight um, to tell you a little bit more about raising chicks. So I will leave it to her. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. So I take it you're all here because you want to raise chickens. <laughs> so about me, um, I worked in commercial ag before I was a dairy nutritionist. For there, from there, I went on to manage a feed mill that was owned by a butcher company. And I wrote the turkey rations and managed the turkey flock for one of the top 100 all natural butcher shops in the country. Um, when they unfortunately went bankrupt post COVID, I, came, I had the great opportunity to come on with Blue Seal, um, really let me go with all my passions from horses to chickens to all of it, um, because it's something I've always done. I've always raised chickens. You can see here we've got three different pictures. These are all, well, chickens I raised, um, some laying hens, a friendly pet, and then even some chicken tenders in the air fryer <laughs> from home raised birds. So the most common bird in the world is the domesticated chicken. There are 9.2 billion of them in the US alone and 33 billion worldwide. And that sounds like a lot of chickens and it is because there's only 8 billion people in the world, give or take, um, at any point in time. So the chickens, the chickens definitely have us outnumbered. And there are a whole bunch of different reasons people raise chickens. First one is pretty obvious, eggs. Um, this is a great way to bring some sustainability to any backyard, get your kids involved with raising food. Um, the other option, what's a chicken presentation without a KFC joke? Some people <laughs> raise chickens for meat as well as show and exhibition. Some people make chickens a hobby. They go all over the state and all up and down the East Coast or even just to the local county fair to exhibit their chickens. And of course, they're just plain fun to have. They make great pets for kids. They have a lot of personality and they can really just add a fun, low maintenance pet to your household that also poops breakfast. So that's a good benefit. So this spring though, we've seen it in all the farm stores, all the feed dealers, every industry has noticed that more people want to raise chickens than ever before because the price of eggs, right? So we may have noticed, I mean, that price of eggs has come down a lot in the past few weeks, but the gap between the cost of raising your own and the cost of the store is closing. So more people than ever before are saying, you know what, sure. I'll have a few chickens in my backyard, make some eggs for my kids and carry on. So the first step on getting chickens, right, is starting your baby chicks. So if you get nothing else out of this presentation, the two things I want you to remember are warm and dry for the first six weeks of their life. That is the most important thing to remember about keeping your baby chicks. So the first thing we need to do is go on a shopping trip, right? To get everything we need, you need a brooder, so a box or an old stock tank, a kiddie pool. This is where you can really get creative. Just a little box to hold your chickens, some sort of heat source, bedding, some blue seal chick starter, a waterer, and a thermometer. Um, obviously, we're not in store today. Usually, I make the offer that I'll hang out for an hour or two when we can get everything we need for our chicks or our birds or whatever we're talking about that day, but you can go on the Country Max website and have everything shipped right to you. So you can still go shopping after this. So you need to buy things that will keep your chicks warm and dry. The next thing you need to do is set up their house, right? To keep them warm and dry. <laughs> um, we want one square foot per baby chick in your brooder. So if you get six baby chicks, which is the New York state minimum, you want a two foot by three foot brooder for six square feet. You want it to have good ventilation, um, but also be free of drafts. You want solid sides, but without it being, you know, stinky and ammonia like in there. You want to keep it safe from children, from pets, from wildlife, um, from, you know, this cat that apparently we don't really need to keep our chicks safe from, but 
You also need access to electricity for your heat source. Make sure it's easy to clean and make sure it's in a fire resistant area. Um, make sure your heat source can be securely fastened. I almost burned down a shed once raising turkeys this way. Um, the heat lamp dropped. Most seasoned chicken keepers have some kind of heat lamp horror story. There are other options available now, such as heating pads or heating plates that your chicks can use. But heat lamps are good. Just make sure they're secured properly. These are some ideas. You can see, you know, a kiddie pool with high size or a box. And both of these have pretty secure heat lamps. So that's really good. When you're dealing with your heat lamp, again, keep a second bulb on hand. Um, they're pretty easy to break, pretty easy to drop. And it will help you avoid that 1030 Walmart trip on a Sunday night that nobody wants to take. And it'll also help keep your chickens warmer. You want to be able to keep the temperature of the brooder between 90 and 95 degrees at the chick level for the first week. Um, you're going to hang your heat lamp off the floor about 18 to 20 inches. And as they grow older, you just pick it up so that it slowly decreases the temperature at bird level. Provide a light source to keep your baby chicks out of the dark. And remember, warm and dry. Heat is really important the first few weeks. They cannot self-regulate their temperature. So this is a nice little slide showing what we aim the temperature to be based on weeks. If they're in your house, probably by week five, you could turn off the heat lamp, right? So we're gonna start at 90 to 95 degrees. And then by week nine, when they're fully feathered, they're ready to go outside and have, you know, stay warm, but we don't need to keep them quite as warm as we do week one. And above all, observe your chicks. Chicks that are too cold will huddle for warmth under the heat lamp. Chicks that are too warm, they'll be all over. They don't want to snuggle at all. And chicks that are just right will hang out all over the brooder. Remember, warm and dry. So this is a nice resource, kind of breaks down if you can tell how your chicks are in the brooder. Um, on the, the left here, we have it's too cold, it's too drafty. See, they're all huddled together under the lamp. Too hot, they're all spread out as far away from the lamp as possible. And just right, you have some that are staying warm, some that are venturing out for some feeder water, and they're pretty just overall happy and using the whole space. Next is bedding. Again, we want bedding that will keep our chicks dry. You want it to be non-slip, so avoid newspaper. The chicks can actually damage their legs and they can get a condition called splay leg um, from having to keep their legs together. It makes it hard for them to walk. You want it to be absorbent and free from strong odors such as cedar chips you want to avoid. Make sure it's easy to compost and clean with minimal dust and it's not easily consumed. Clumping cat litter sounds like it would be a great idea, but it's too dusty for the chicks. And if they eat it, which they will, they're babies. They put everything in their mouths, right? That's one thing all species, they'll consume it and it'll uh, bind up in their insides. And ultimately it's probably pretty fatal. One good idea um, is if you go to Walmart, they have incontinence pads for like beds. Um, you can put an incontinence pad under the bedding and put a little bit of wood chips on top. They're not slippery at all. And it makes it really easy to clean. You just all the corners, grab and go, sort of like the cat litter liners. So in, we want to measure the air temperature, but we want to make sure it's clean and it's not drafty, all right? So we're not getting some draft every time somebody opens the door. Make sure they get some fresh air though. Aquarium tanks generally don't work well for this purpose because of the lack of ventilation. And most brooders should have a fairly open top. If you need to protect it from your kids, your pets, your wildlife, think more chicken wire, less plywood. <laughs> and remember, keep your chicks warm and dry. That is the biggest takeaway from this presentation. So step three, right? We need feed and water. So these are some options for feeders. We have this one on the side, your kind of traditional gravity feeder. And then we have a six hole feeder. You can actually screw a mason jar on top of, or you can buy the plastic jar. And then we have the long um, tray feeders, I guess they're called, slide feeders. Um, these are really good if you have really young chicks and you want to put half under the heat and half not, so they don't have to leave the heat lamp to go eat. All of which are equally good. It depends upon your program, um, the space in your brooder, and how many chicks you have as far as which one you want. So also remember the ease of cleaning. You're going to have to wash this thing once or twice a week. 
So here's the big question I get a lot is medicated or non-medicated. So in the U.S. and actually worldwide, there are no synthetic hormones made for chickens. So when you go to the store and your chicken says hormone free, of course it is. They're not even manufactured. Um, the chicken farmers, on top of being illegal, they can't go rogue and buy them because that's not a thing. Um, medicated feeds don't contain hormones, like all chicken feed. They don't contain growth stimulants, and they don't contain antibiotics used in human treatment. Medicated feed contains medication just to help control coccidiosis in your chicken's GI, baby chick's GI tract. It, coccidiosis is everywhere. If you were to swab like my cell phone, the back of your cell phone, it would probably come up positive for coccidia. Um, humans and pets and adults, we all have a natural immunity to it. Baby chicks just don't have that. The medication helps them fight it off. And just like all medications, it doesn't stay in their system for life. So if you feed your baby chicks an amprolium medicated starter, you're not going to get amprolium medicated eggs in 20 weeks. Um, for example, I had you know a little bit of bronchitis a few weeks ago. I went to the doctor, they gave me antibiotics. And in you know the end of the summer, like I always do with my allergies and I get a little bit of bronchitis again, I'm still gonna need antibiotics again because they didn't live in my system from uh, March until July or whatever, right? So just like it works for us, it works for animals. Um, if you're not comfortable with a medicated starter and you still want your chicks to be protected against coccidiosis, recommend getting them vaccinated at the hatchery. You don't need to feed them a medicated feed, but it doesn't cause them any harm if you do after they've been vaccinated for coccidia. So this is our, the Blue Seal uh, Home Fresh Chick Starter. It is medicated with amprolium, again, for coccidiosis. It's a really high energy, low fiber, really nutrient dense blend. We have a fixed formula product. So it's the same every week, every time. It's the same recipe, the same grains are used, and there's no animal products in any of our feeds. This is made right actually in Arcade, New York with all USA sourced grains and actually mostly New York sourced grains too, right? When you think about it, we're obviously gonna buy the corn in New York first. We also have our NutriVantage technology, which is a blend of natural ingredients. Um, reed sedge peat is one of them. And that is, it helps your chickens GI health. And there's a bunch of different size options available. If you just have a few chicks and you want to get a seven pound bag, we offer that as well as 25 and 50 pound bags. So these are some options for waterers. Um, you can see on the left, your typical kind of screw on. And you can see on the right, we have a nipple drinker. And up top here, we have what's called a quail base for your littler chickens. In the bottom, your standard screw on for mason jar. So when you are raising baby chicks, you need to consider how many you have, how often you can feed and water them, how easy it is to clean, and your size of chicks. Um, quail or bannies, a lot of times we'll need that quail base. And another thing you can consider is the marble trick. Um, chicks aren't the most intelligent animal in the world. <laughs> and sometimes they will fall asleep while they're drinking at the waterer and they will submerge their little noses and they will drown right there. And it's rather unfortunate. And one thing you can do to prevent this is put marbles around the base of your water. They can still reach their beacon and get some water, but it holds their face out of the water enough that they can't submerge their nostrils and drown. So as your chicks age, you might notice that they poop all over everything all of the time, including where they eat and what they drink. So you want to elevate those feed and waters to the height of the back of the smallest chick in the tank. So they have to reach up a little bit, but they're not, you know, up on their tiptoes. You want to change or clean out your feeder at least once, feed and water at least once a day. Um, it helps keep your brooder clean and will extend the life of your bedding if you spot clean, especially around the waterer where it gets really wet. And thoroughly clean both your feeder and your waterer at least once a week with really hot water and soap. Um, just anything you would normally do your dishes with. Um, I'm sort of lazy and just throw it in my dishwasher. That also works. So some things to remember. You might need to provide some more space as chicks grow, especially if you're using a cardboard box, you might want a bigger one as they get a little bigger. Um, and you wanna reduce your temperature gradually by about five degrees per week until it's 65. You really wanna avoid suddenly pulling the heat away and having the chicks get sort of a temperature shock. 
And you want to disinfect those feeders and waterers once a week. Hot water, mild dish soap will be your best friend. And above all, warm and dry. Those are your two biggest factors of success when it comes to raising chicks. So here comes the fun part is going to the store and getting chicks. You wanna make sure that your young birds are healthy before you put them in the brooder. Um, you know, just like you send your kids to school and they come back with every cold and sniffle under the sun. It's the same way with baby chicks when you put them in a big group. You're going to want to call or separate any sickly birds immediately. Um, signs of illness can just be lethargy, sneezing, closed eyes, reluctance to sit in, pasty butt, like this guy in the middle here with poop all over him, and just overall sad looking. Try to avoid bringing them home and exposing them to your healthy chicks or have a separate area, you know, sort of a sort of a baby chick hospital in your house. So when you're buying chicks and you're looking at the tank, you might notice some words that we use. So bantam, these are tiny ornamental chickens. They don't, they're not, you know, they're not gonna lay a huge egg, but they're they're tiny and they're fun. Then we have broilers. These are typically straight run. So it's a mix of males and females and they are for meat production only. We'll get through that in a little bit. Dual purpose is a chick that will grow up to be a decent egg layer and also a decent meat bird. So if you're not really sure what you wanna do or you wanna put your hens in the stew pot after they're done laying, this is a great option. An egg layer is a chick that will grow up and be an awesome egg layer. She might not be the biggest bird, she might not be the best carcass, but that's fine because she'll make lots of eggs. A heritage breed is a chick that was a breed that was developed a long time ago for a specific purpose and has been maintained as the breed type. A pullet is all female chicks. This is something you might wanna consider if you're only looking for eggs and you don't want there to be a rooster as opposed to straight run, which is a mix of male and female chicks. Um, some chicks are what we call sex linked. And this is where the baby chicks have been selectively bred to have the females and the males be very, very different colors um, when they hatch out of the egg. So that's a great way. It's the only way you can really be guaranteed to have no rooster is to purchase a breed that is sex linked. And remember, most hatcheries only guarantee a 90% accuracy when sexing baby chicks. And you think, oh, only 90%, like that's awful. When you, when you do this, you might want to have a plan to get rid of a rooster, um, whether that's a stew pot, the auction house, um, giving it to a friend or another chicken keeper, putting it on Facebook Marketplace. However you need to get rid of that rooster, don't feel guilty. They are not for everybody. And a lot of homeowners associations and villages don't even allow you to have them, um, not because, just because of their temperament, but because of their crowing. So they are loud. And I think every chicken keeper has a story like this poor little boy in the picture does at some point with a rooster. So another option when it comes to chicks is the vaccines. We already talked about the coccidiosis. I would highly recommend that all chicks going to a home with small kids, or if you really wanna handle them a lot, um, be vaccinated for coccidiosis simply because coccidia is just everywhere. It's not hard to bring it into your chickens Merrick's disease is a little tougher to spread, but it is from bird to bird. It causes just weird, crazy things to happen. They can survive it, but then they go on to just continue to share the love um, that is Merrick's disease for the rest of their lives with all the other birds they encounter. Um, if you want to take your birds to a show, even if it's just the local county fair, a lot, well, all, all fairs require polarium testing, and you're going to want to contact your local extension agency to find out a little more about just what is required. So chickens come in all shapes and sizes, right? We can't decide which one, which one we can get. The American Poultry Association is the governing body for chicken breeders. There are over 400 chicken breeds and most of them have different varieties in those breeds. And there are over a thousand chicken shows held in the US every year. Um, they publish a book called The Standard of Perfection, and that sets the ideal qualities for both each breed and the variety within the breed. So some good options. We have your white leg horns. These are four to five pounds when mature. They lay a lot of big white eggs every year. And they're sort of nervous and flighty. Um, they're a very vocal breed as well. 
but they are cold and heat hardy and they're really feed efficient. So if you're looking for, you know, a good bird that you're not looking to cuddle real often <laughs> and you don't have a lot of neighbors that will complain about the noise and you want eggs, this is, this is a great option. Then there's the California white. They're a little less flighty than the leghorns, but they're still pretty active and alert. Makes them really good free rangers along with the leghorns. Their natural sort of flighty temperament prevents them from deciding to make friends with the local raccoon or, you know, weasel. They're about four to five pounds when mature and pretty similar to the leghorn. And the brown leghorn, if you don't want white chickens, you can get brown chickens. And they also lay about 300 large white eggs a year. And they're also pretty active, flighty, vocal, um, and tough. So they're a really good option for, you know, if you have a lot of predation and not a lot of neighbors, great birds. And these are all white egg layers. Then we have some brown egg layers. This is the Issa brown. They're five to six pounds when mature. They lay about 320 large brown eggs a year. So they're pretty productive too. And they're a little more docile, a little easily handled. And they're cold and heat hardy. And their sex links, the pullets are all hatched red. So you can see here, this is the male and the female. Um, pretty darn easy to tell. So that's a good way to be guaranteed to not have any roosters, right? Is you pick all the red ones <laughs> from this breed when they're babies. Next is the Australorp. This is an Australian breed of chicken. They are five to six pounds when mature. They lay 250 big brown eggs a year. They're also pretty easily handled. Um, very mild mannered, they're big, and they have a pretty solid carcass weight on them as well if you're looking for a good dual purpose breed. And they're very cold and heat hardy, um, very, very good for your upstate New York climate. Then the black sex link as opposed to the Issa brown, um, also similar except they are hatched out black. Very docile, easily handled. Now we have your colored egg layers. So these are, you know, your green eggs and ham chickens. <laughs> these are the Americanas. They lay 240 medium, just colored eggs per year. Um, you can have them range anywhere from pink to blue to green to olive. They are very friendly, very easy to handle, um, very cold and heat hardy. They're, they're tough and they're just the cutest little chicks. And look at these eggs. So this is a typical basket of your Americana eggs. So not something you're used to seeing. And then these are the Morans. Um, these are my personal favorites. They're huge and they lay just beautiful chocolate colored eggs. Um, similar in temperament to the Americana, very easy to handle. And look how pretty those eggs are, right? Like I just like seeing a whole dozen of those nice chocolate eggs. And then we have the Plymouth Rock. Um, their coloration makes them tougher for aerial predators to see and prey on with that barred feather color. They're five to six pounds when mature, uh, 250 big brown eggs a year, and they are super friendly, super quiet, super easy. Um, I had one that was just absolutely determined that she was going to come in my house um, consistently. And it was sort of an issue to the point where there were like signs on the door, like make sure the chicken doesn't follow you in. Um, she was great, we called her baby chicken. <laughs> and they're very cold and heat hardy. Great for upstate New York, easy to find, common breed. As well as the Buff Orpington, they're a lot bigger. Um, they're your big, fluffy, just cool looking chickens. 200 medium brown eggs per year, very friendly. Um, some people do butcher these as well. They're because they're big and they, they flesh out well. And then the Jersey Giant, these, these are huge. They are eight to nine pounds when mature. They're just, just hard to wrap your head around. And they lay 240 like huge brown eggs per year. They're really friendly, they're docile, they're cold and heat hardy. And it's just their size makes them hard to prey on, right? I mean, to take down a nine pound chicken is that that takes takes some gumption. Then, I mean, pretty much the opposite of your Jersey Giant is your little coaching bannies. These are two to three pounds, uh, little puff balls. They lay a hundred teeny teeny little brown eggs per year. They're friendly, they're quiet, they're cold and heat hardy, and they're just good moms too. So if you're looking to raise out your own chickens, some people have coach and bannies around just to sit on their eggs. These are silkies. Um, everybody likes silkies. Um, you wouldn't think they'd be good in the New York winter, but they are. They can hold their own. They lay tight, 100 
tiny little brown eggs per year. If you're looking for good layers, bantams really aren't your best option. They're also very good mothers, very prone to going broody. Um, and again, they're friendly. They were made to be ornamental. So the temperament was very much taken into consideration when developing the breed. Then you have the old English bantam. These are these are not your friendly chickens. <laughs> when we talk about little banny roosters, this is this is where it came from. They are alert, they're busy, they're confident, and they're pretty tough. Um, makes them very predator resistant um, when they're not trying to take on the predator. Like this guy here. This is this is your your little banny rooster. Is <laughs> is an old English game here. So. See, he has no idea that he weighs about a pound and a half. He's he's ready to take on the world. Then we have our Cornish cross. So these are eight to 10 pound carcass weights with six to 10 weeks. They are aloof. They are very friendly. And they're just not as smart or as resistant to predators as your other birds. They are very cold and heat sensitive. Um, a common misconception about this chicken is that they're genetically modified. That is highly illegal. It doesn't happen in the US. They have been bred to be what we call a terminal cross. So when you think about it, like how you know your wolf was bred selectively over millennia to make a chihuahua, this is sort of the chihuahua of the chicken world where it's so different from its predecessors um, because of selective breeding forever and ever and ever. Um, do not try to purchase these birds to save them from the meat market they will ultimately grow themselves to death. They will grow so much they break their legs. They have heart attacks. They are not meant to live um, very long, but you can give them a perfectly happy, healthy life out on pasture for eight to 10 weeks before you put them in your freezer, uh, which, is, which is a good use, right? Nothing wrong with that. So you need to think when you're selecting your chickens, your baby chicks at the store, why you want to raise chickens, how much space do you have, you know, do you want to handle your birds? Do you just want to go in and go in and give them feed and get the eggs? And do you want to free range them? So let's pick out our new friends here, some chickens. This is Erin. Erin has a small backyard on the outskirts of town. She has three little kids and they all really want chickens to pet and show at the county fair. They just joined a 4-H group where, you know, they're really excited. They don't, they think scrambled eggs are gross, but some, sometimes they bake, right? I mean, who doesn't make a box of Betty Cracker brownies with their kids? So Erin doesn't want chickens taking up too much space in her yard. There's already a rabbit cage and a vegetable garden, and they're trying to do the self-sustainability thing on like an acre. And she wants fun pets for her kids to learn a little responsibility um, and just enjoy and take the fair. So what would be a good chicken for her? Your coaching bannies or your silkies, right? They're tiny, they're small, they don't need a lot of space. These are both relatively quiet breeds, so they won't totally drive her neighbors nuts. And I mean, who doesn't want a little silky bantam for their kid to take to the fair, right? Then we have Debbie. She has a small farm in rural New York. She has a busy road, but not a lot of neighbors. And she wants to sell eggs in her farm stand that's already really busy. She likes chickens and she is pretty good at taking care of them, but she's way too busy tending her vegetable garden to cuddle them. She wants a breed that's a really productive layer that she can also let roam in her garden a little bit, right? So some good chickens for her would be your Leghorns or your Issa Browns. They're good producers. They will keep themselves alive by not trying, again, they won't try to make friends with the local raccoon. <laughs> they all sense danger and, you know, go away. And because she doesn't have many neighbors, they won't mind the vocalization because they are quite loud. So then there's Joyce. She has a lot of land in sort of a semi-rural area. Her six kids have asked her every single year if they can get chickens. And she's like, you know what? Eggs are like seven bucks at the grocery store. Sure, 2023 is the year. She, <laughs> she likes to bake and every morning she cooks her family eggs for breakfast. She has three teenage sons and they're all linebackers on the football team. So her grocery bill is, is, is scary, right? She wants chickens that can feed her three sons and will be fun pets for her three little girls who just joined a 4-H chicken group. And they're really excited just to have the chickens. 
So some options for her would be your Barn Crocs, your Jersey Giants, your Americanas. So these are all breeds that are pretty darn productive, but also friendly, right? The Jersey Giant eggs will be great for her older boys. The younger kids will really like the green eggs from the Americanas. And all three of these breeds are good, hearty breeds that are friendly and produce a lot of eggs. So that all, all of them would be good fits for her family. Then we have Roy. He just retired to a farm in a really rural area. He has a big chest freezer and he wants to raise all his own food this year, but he doesn't really have enough land or experience yet. Um, doesn't want to raise pigs or cattle. He has some laying birds his kids gave him and he won't ever eat them. So he has plenty of eggs for him and his wife. But unfortunately, his wife is getting a surgery at the end of the summer, so he only has like three months to fill this freezer. And then he'll be really busy taking care of her. He just wants chickens that'll yield well, and he'll be ready, he'll be ready in three months to put them in his freezer. Right? Cornish cross. This is a great use for them. They can still thrive on pasture. And Roy can fill his freezer without having to take on, you know, the heavy lifting and the safety precautions that we often forget about with pigs and cattle and other sources of raising your own protein. Um, these are great, this Cornish cross is great for your beginning homesteader or somebody looking to, you know, raise their own meat for the first time because as compared to, you know, a full-size pig or a cow, they're a lot safer to handle as well. So now our baby chicks that we've made good selection of are all grown up. And they're fully feathered. They look sort of like these, I don't know, can I call them ugly? Because they are. Uh, it's not an insult, it's just a fact. Um, ugly little creatures. They're fully feathered. There's no extreme temperatures. If there's snow on the ground, don't put them outside. Just trust me here. Um, consider damp conditions. If it's really damp and it's going to rain all week, but the temperature's good, consider holding off. Um, as Again, it's tough for them to, to temperature regulate that first week. Um, having them be wet doesn't help. And you also want to consider some other factors such as predation, security of the area, and your other chicken's personalities. I had this one hen, we called her Brassy, and she was just absolutely awful to anybody new we tried to put in there. So we would raise the chicks a little longer in the brooder just so they didn't get picked on quite as bad. One thing you can do is you can consider some field trips during nice weather and handle your chicks a lot to make them easier to catch to bring back inside if you're going to do some field trips. You can see here, this is a pretty simple setup. Um, just a couple boards and some chicken wire over it. Gets the chicks used to the outside, lets the older chickens get used to them. Everybody can see each other all as well. You wanna put your new chicks in at night after the other chickens have fallen asleep. That way they just wake up in the morning and they, they don't even know where these new friends came from, but they're cool with it, right? Cause they all roosted together last night. The other thing you can consider is making a safe area that the chicks can get to that the bigger chickens can't access. Especially if you have a big bossy bully hen, like my brassy girl was, she was awful. So when, when do I get eggs, right? <laughs> Typically at five to six months old, at two years old, hens will, their production will slowly decline. They go through henopause, if you will, um, just like people. In your first egg, it might be kind of weird, right? Like this one here on the left is a lot smaller. It's sort of a funny shape. Um, that's pretty common as the chicks, chicks get going and they turn into chickens. Um, takes some time for their reproductive tract to be normal. So sometimes you'll get an egg every two, three days. Sometimes it takes them a while to get to the point where they lay every day. Sometimes you'll get eggs without the shell. Sometimes you'll get weird shaped ones. Um, and just, just be patient. Just they're figuring it out. Takes them some time. So a blood spot. Eggs with a visible blood spot on the yolk, they're perfectly safe to eat. Consider baking with them or scrambling them if you don't like looking at it. These tiny spots, they're not harmful. It's just a blood vessel that ruptured during the formation of the egg. It's no indication of fertilization or not. So one thing that might be a little abnormal, but it's nothing to worry about. So my chickens stop laying. And some factors of that are your daylight. Um, as the days get shorter, the hen's reproductive systems do slow down. Molt, so as they shed their feathers, they are using their bodily energy towards molting and making new feathers, not eggs. Uh, unsanitary or overcrowded living conditions can absolutely 
bring on chickens to stop laying. They don't want to reproduce and bring babies, babies, um, into an area that isn't fit, right? Lack of water is another big reason chickens won't lay or lack of quality water. Um, when you think about how wet an egg is, right? Eggs are, there's a lot of water, so chickens need to drink to be able to produce it. Um, we already talked about henopause when they're two years old and just starting to slow down, as well as stress. And what's been a hot topic lately is lack of proper nutrition. Um, this is the one everybody wants to blame, but more commonly, it's one of the others that is causing your chickens to stop laying. So on the topic of proper nutrition, we have three types of feed. You have your mash, your pellets, and your crumbles. Those are your textures. And the manufacturing process is really similar on all of them. Um, a crumble and a pellet is just a mash that's been hit with some steam and pressed through a die to make a shape. So start baby chicks on a mash or a crumble because it's easier for them to eat with their tiny beaks. And these are some options we have from Blue Seal. We have our home fresh starter, which is medicated. And you want to feed that from zero to eight weeks of age. Then your grow and show, which is eight to 20 weeks of age or whenever they start laying. And then your home fresh extra egg that you feed them throughout adulthood. So our home fresh starter, we already talked about it. It does also have some digestive enzymes, prebiotics, probiotics, a really good mineral pack made with all organic trace minerals. Our NutriVantage technology is exclusive to Blue Seal. This is a fixed formula, no animal products, and it's a really high energy, low fiber at 20% protein, 4% fiber, nutrient dense blend. Then this is their grow and show. It's a 15% protein, 5% fiber, a little lower protein, but still low fiber, energy dense with your prebiotics, your probiotics, and your enzymes, as well as your organic trace minerals. And again, this is also made in Arcade, New York with all USA source grains, most of which come from the East Coast. And this is our extra egg. It's a 16% protein, 4% fiber, um, similar to all of our other feeds in the sense of it's a fixed formula, no animal byproducts, prebiotics, probiotics, digestive enzymes. It also includes essential oils and marigold extract to help keep those birds, the yolks on their eggs, really bright yellow. And this also involves our NutriVantage technology. So if you're looking for another option, this is more of our value line. We have our field and farm starter crumble. We use that from zero to eight weeks and then our layer pellet from eight weeks on. So this is also available at Country Max. It's a 20% protein, 7% fiber. This is also a fixed formula feed. So no animal byproducts, no animal products at all. Also made in Arcade New York, all USA source grains added amino acids, high quality trace minerals. This is not medicated. Um, and it's just a really good option for those on a budget or if you have a lot of chickens, as well as the layer pellet, 16% protein, 6% fiber. Um, and again, it might be a value feed, but it's still that high quality blue seal nutrition with the fixed formula, no animal products, organic trace minerals, added amino acids, these are some other fun options we have. We do offer an organic poultry feed as well as treats and scratch grain, all of which are available at Country Max. So thank you. Do you have any questions? This was this was a gift that I couldn't fit into the presentation, but I thought it was way too fun not to include. <laughs> right? <laughs>